All right, so torque in positive y direction, angular momentum changes in positive y direction. So if I let go of this with my, hand, with my left hand, the angular momentum changes in the positive y direction. Right now there's no angular momentum. So it rotates clockwise, which means it's changing that way. What if there was angular momentum? What if I rotate this thing so that the angular momentum vector points to your right? So the angular momentum vector points like that, and the change in angular momentum is perpendicular to it. Because I can do that. What happens if the change, if the angular momentum vector points to the right and the change is perpendicular to it? The change is to the backward. And that's what happens. It goes that way because there's a torque that there's a torque that takes the angular momentum vector and makes it go backwards. In fact, that torque is always there, so it's always perpendicular to the angular momentum vector. You can see that there's no real pivot point here. I kind of pretended that this was a pivot point, but as soon as I let go of it, uh, my so-called pivot point starts moving around a little bit. So it's a little hard to analyze, analyze well, but what this is called is precession. This thing precesses around because there's a torque on it and it has an angular momentum. And so its angular momentum is always changing perpendicular to the angular momentum itself. When the angular momentum is this way and the change is that way, then it does that. And then the change is this way, so it does that. And the angular momentum vector just walks around. How many of you have heard of NMR or magnetic resonance imaging? When you put a magnetic field on a, on a nucleus that has a magnetic moment, uh, you are putting a torque on it. That nucleus has an angular momentum, and when you put a torque on it, its angular momentum vector precesses around. It does exactly what that thing was doing. Because when you put it in a magnetic field, all that does is apply a torque. And that nucleus has angular momentum, and so the angular momentum precesses around. Um, not going to make you do anything with angular with uh, with NMR, but I just thought I'd mention that. Um, any questions about what's going on? You'll get a chance to play with these things in in DL. All right, this is getting slightly ahead of ourselves, but, but maybe not too much since these are, all, all I'm really going to talk about is interaction ideas that, that you've already talked about a little bit, but that you should understand well. So uh, we're going to talk about Newton's laws. Newton's first law says, uh, has a connection between interactions and motion. Newton's second law, I've already kind of said this, that this, this right here is essentially a statement of Newton's second law. It's already a connection between interactions and translational motion. Interactions are dealt with in terms of forces. Interactions from outside the system are Forces that are acting on the physical system by something outside the physical system. When you add up a bunch of forces like that, so, so th let's say the, uh, my physical system is object A, then to add up a bunch of forces acting on object A, I, let's say object B acts on object A, I add that one, C, D, maybe there's more things that are, that are either touching uh, the object or are interacting with it with some other kind of force. 
You just add up all of those vectors to find out what the net force is. That tells you about interactions. Interactions with the outside world then by way of Newton's second law tell you about the motion of that object, whether that motion is changing. I am going to, I have tried to do this already and I'm going to try to keep doing it and ask you to do it. Uh, when you write a force vector, you should name both objects that are interacting. And that's mainly a way of being sure that you understand what you're, what you're uh, drawing there. What two objects are interacting? What is this, which one is this force on? And what's producing the force on it? So force by A on B. Every interaction has two things, at least. And so we, we split it down into always only two things, like my hand interacts with this table. There's a hand, a table, uh, my hand loses heat to the table, the table gains heat from my hand. The other thing I want to do is stress that there really, in this class, there are really only two kinds of forces. Contact forces, if two objects touch each other, then they can be interacting. If they touch, then there could be a force. The only other kind of forces, if, if they're not touching, the only way they can be interacting is with some long range force. And sorry, I pasted this from 9A, but that's okay. 7B is the same thing. The only long range force we have is a gravitational interaction. The Earth pulls on you. It's the only one. The Earth doesn't, the Earth pulls on you whether or not it touches you. I can throw this up in the air, it comes back down again. All of, a lot of that motion, some of it's because I threw it, but a lot of that motion is because the Earth is pulling on it. Even though they weren't touching. So, if two things are interacting and they're not touching, then it better be gravity. Better be a gravity interaction. I got two quick questions for you. Picture to the right shows a hand pushing on block B, which results in the spring being compressed a distance X to the left. So you've compressed a spring. Blocks A and B are resting on a table. The hand A interacts with block B with a significant contact force, interacts with block B with a long range force, or has no significant interaction with block B. So I'm taking as a physical system block B and asking about things that interact with it. So what about the hand? 